Willard Frederick Rockwell was born in Boston in 1888, the son of a prosperous builder of homes and apartment houses. His father owned one of the first automobiles ever seen in their hometown, a Knox chain drive over and under, which his father and brothers and he tinkered with endlessly, learning the rudiments of automobile mechanics. Small for his age, young Bill Rockwell was an athletic boy, playing football and winning fame as a pole vaulter. He attended Boston's Mechanical Arts High School and then enrolled in the nearby Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He fell in love with his childhood sweetheart, Miss Clara Thayer. She was one of the Boston Thayers, direct descendants of John Alden from the Mayflower. On June 8, 1908, they took a train to Providence and were secretly married. They were both 19 years old. They kept their secret for five months, living separately at their parents' homes while he attended school. When they finally made their announcement, it was the talk of the town. It was a tough time to be starting a family. With the country in a recession and a baby on the way, Willard found a job in the testing lab of a cider plant for $8 a week. Two years later, when the cider mill burned down, he was looking for work again. It was the new age of the efficiency expert, and Willard Rockwell caught the eye of a prominent Boston businessman who hired him to organize an industrial consulting service. It was a custom-made opportunity for the bright, ambitious young engineer. For the next three years, he traveled widely to more than a hundred plants and factories in many lines of manufacturing, surveying operations, and recommending changes while he broadened his knowledge of industry and sharpened his management skills. Clara and Willard changed homes frequently during these years to be close to his work and to accommodate their growing family. Their first daughter, Catherine, had been born in 1909 and was followed closely by Janet, Willard Jr., Eleanor, and Elizabeth. As his business career developed, they moved six times in 17 years to be together. In 1915, they moved to Cleveland when Willard was hired by the Torbison Axle Company to build a new axle plant. After construction was finished, he was made factory manager and he quickly tripled their production. In the next three years, Torbison grew to be the largest manufacturer of truck axles in the nation. When the United States entered into World War I, the demand for their five-ton rear axle drives grew rapidly. Willard Rockwell entered the U.S. Army Motor Transport Division as a civilian specialist, designing and producing military truck axles. After the war, he continued as a commissioned officer in the Quartermaster Reserve Corps, working to develop better military vehicles. He would eventually achieve the rank of Colonel, a title he would carry for the rest of his life. In Cleveland, they called him the Human Dynamo. He returned to Torbison as a vice president and offered them two new axle types that he had designed. When the company's management declined to produce them, he quit in a huff and went off on his own. With his small savings, he bought a bankrupt axle plant in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and moved the family there in 1920. Willard Rockwell always said that he had two empires. One was his business, and the other was his family. Both grew in Oshkosh. Their first year of business was a great success, but then the post-war recession combined with a government sale of cheap war surplus trucks almost wiped out the young company. Willard pinned his hopes for survival on his new axle design, a double reduction gear that provided higher axle efficiency. His longtime friend and associate, L.A. Dixon, remembers. I suppose there's two or three uh, uh, happenings that uh, have always stuck out in my mind as being uh, the uh, 
best of our experiences. One was in the Depression of 1920 and 21, when the Colonel took us to dinner at the old Atherton Hotel in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. When I say he took us, he took the entire staff and practically the entire office for us, which was about 10 of us, and told us that we couldn't have another depression like this uh, uh, in our time uh, because we probably wouldn't be able to survive it. Therefore, we were going to diversify. And we've been diversifying ever since. Meanwhile, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Mellon brothers were having car trouble. For 10 years, they had manufactured a luxury automobile as an offshoot of their railroad car business. But by 1923, the Standard Steel 8 was losing them millions of dollars, and they decided to close the business. To fill their empty factory, the Mellons purchased and relocated the Equitable Meter Company, a maker of gas meters and regulators. To run the new company, they recruited Willard F. Rockwell, who they remembered from his days as a consulting engineer. They offered him a stock interest in the company if he would move to Pittsburgh. But when we came here, uh, father came first, and so that summer, he brought the whole family, and we all lived in two apartments down in Squirrel Hill. I can't think of the name of the apartment house now, but it's still there. Uh, right above Polis, whatever the name of that is. We had two apartments across the hall. Stayed there all summer. And he used to go crazy trying to get us to a swimming pool someplace. We went to Kennywood, we went to the Willows. His father wanted to swim. He liked water. And uh, we tried them all. Then the next summer we went to our, our house that we had from then on, although we were renters through that first summer and didn't buy the house until just before Christmas we moved our furniture in. And uh, by that next spring, he was building a swimming pool. <laughs> he couldn't stand it. And so the professionals built the pool and it came out of the side of the hill. Father went to work and put all this brickwork around, making a couple of dressing rooms. He put the shelter on the, off the walk around the pool and then he would dive from the roof of the shelter. He loved to dive from a height. By 1929, the Rockwell's Wisconsin Axle Company had been renamed the Wisconsin Auto Parts Company to reflect their expanded product line. They had attracted the attention of an industry giant, Timken Detroit Axle Company, who saw the value in the Colonel's innovative designs. In exchange, they offered an attractive stock deal, and when the two companies merged, Willard Rockwell was named as a director. And in Pittsburgh, the Mellons were having similar problems with the Standard Steel Spring Company. They turned to Colonel Rockwell because he had experience with the large manufacturers of cars and trucks and could sell them springs and bumpers. So there he was in mid-depression America as president of three major companies. He was constantly on the move. Father traveled all the time. He was gone almost from Sunday night to Friday night. He was an early flyer. He flew as much as he could. He had old trophies and things from his flying. Some of the later ones were well known and written up and so on, but he was traveling a long time before that. In the fall of 1931, the Colonel and his son Al took a cross-country trip to California. 
traveling on commercial airlines in a variety of aircraft, the trip awoke in young Al a love and fascination for flying that was to last his whole life. Returning to the East, Al attended Penn State University, where he majored in industrial engineering. He joined Kappa Sigma fraternity and graduated in 1935. His uncle Walter offered Al a job with Timken Detroit Axel. He wanted him to learn the family business from the bottom up. But the colonel had other plans for his only son. It was the summer of 1935. I was scheduled to go to work for Walter Rockwell in Detroit. But mother came up one morning as I was enjoying my summer vacation and said, get up, your father wants you to go to the office with him. I said yes, promptly rolled over and went back to sleep. A few minutes later, she came back up and said, Al, come on, get up. Your father wants you to go over to the office with him. So I went to, went to work with him. And when he got me over there, he said, Al, he said, I appreciate, I can understand you're wanting to go work on your own and go to work for Walter up there, but I'd like to have you work for me. His first assignment was a short stint in Oakland, California, at Pittsburgh Equitable's Nordstrom Valve Division. It was a lucky trip for him. While visiting at the home of relatives, he was introduced to Miss Constance Templeton, who was to become his wife. Al returned to Pittsburgh in 1938 to become vice president and controller of Pittsburgh Equitable Meter Company at the age of 24. From that point, he was on his way to the top of the colonel's empire. He was much more soft-spoken than his father, in my opinion. And I know Al would be the first to admit that Al himself was, was very creative and a good leader. Uh, the colonel had built up such momentum, he would say to me once in a while that while he was proud to be chief executive officer of the uh, Rockwell, that he knew his father had generated the momentum that kind of carried it through. In 1938, the colonel returned from a trip to Europe, saying that if war comes, Hitler will find that England is prepared. And, if war comes, America will have a hard time staying out. He was correct. In October of 1941, Colonel Willard Rockwell was called to Washington for extended service as assistant to the chief of the Motor Transport Division of the Army. As the war developed, he was appointed director of production in the U.S. Maritime Commission. His task was to speed up the effort to replace the dreadful toll of Allied vessels sunk by enemy submarines. He also served on the War Production Board and the Executive Committee of the Army-Navy Munitions Board. Well, there are those who believe that industry won the war, not the troops, even though the troops were the martyrs and so on, that uh, American industry won the war, and certainly the Colonel had a great part in that and well deserved the title colonel and used it the rest of his life. Like most men his age, Al Rockwell served in the Army. Rising to the rank of captain, he was stationed first in New York and then in Washington. By the end of the war, Al and Connie's young family had grown to include Patricia Lynn, Willard III, and Stephen Kent. Nineteen forty-five saw the next step in the Colonel's grand plan to expand and diversify. Power tool, valve, and woodworking equipment companies were acquired as subsidiaries of Pittsburgh Equitable. Taxi meters, parking meters, and fare registers came next, and the company's name was changed to the Rockwell Manufacturing Company to reflect their expanded operations. This is a sealed register water meter. Almost everyone has, in the Pittsburgh area anyway, has one of these in their basement. Rockwell was very big in measuring devices, gas, uh, water, fuels, that type of thing. But this was typical of, of Rockwell for several reasons. First off, the colonel had the, the uh, foresight to go into small areas, 
construct prod, or construct manufacturing sites and and help a community. This particular water meter was developed in our research and development, and he that was one of his high priorities. But this was made for years down in Uniontown, and uh, Rockwell not only had diversified products, but they had quality products. Sometimes I think maybe this one was too good because the darn things just never seemed to wear out. But millions, and I, I, I wouldn't even tempt to quote the number of these sealed register meters that were made and sold. Al Rockwell returned from the war to become vice president of the new company and two years later was elected president. He was 34 years old and was definitely on the fast track. The family empire also grew rapidly, as spooked in this early home movie shot by the Colonel. In the years after the war, with all of his children now married, Willard Rockwell had his hands full to even line up the family for their annual Christmas picture. Al and Connie contributed two more sons to the picture, with the birth of George Peter in 1947 and Russell in 1948. Al suggested that Russell's middle name be Alden to reflect the family's relationship to John Alden. Connie agreed, but wanted it spelled all done. With Al in charge of manufacturing, the Colonel was able to give more time to the automotive business. In 1952, he was able to accomplish a merger between Timken Detroit and Standard Steel Spring that resulted in the birth of Rockwell Standard Corporation a major independent producer of parts for the automotive, farm, and construction industries. The 1950s and early 60s was a time of great activity for both Rockwells and both Rockwell businesses. While Al's role expanded at both companies, the Colonel became a public figure. He spent more time in Washington and at his vacation home on Miami Beach. Nominated as Assistant Secretary of Defense, he declined the nomination because it required him to divest himself of stock in his own companies to avoid a conflict of interest. As he later put it, the government wants successful men for the job, as long as they don't have any money. He was an outspoken critic of government spending and taxation, feeling that business must be free of restraints for the country to prosper. A Pittsburgh newspaper called him a pre-McKinley industrialist, and he took it as a compliment. Colonel Rockwell on industrial give and take. We were in the Pittsburgh area uh, to a much greater extent uh, after the war, but uh, sh shortly after that, we ran into difficulties. The uh, workers joined the union, and uh, we found it very difficult to get them to keep up production. Among other things, after the Supreme Court made the decision that everybody in industry had to pay portal to portal pay, uh, the union filed a suit against us for six million dollars, claiming it took five minutes to get to and from their places of work. They also admitted when I asked them why they uh, stood at their machines from 4.15 to 4.30 and did nothing, uh, that they were so tired by that time that they couldn't work. So. Uh, we filed an $18 million suit against the unions for uh, the time they took off, which was not in the union agreement. That's one reason we moved out, and the competitors of ours who were in the city at that time who didn't move out have since sold out. But Pittsburgh was still his home. Not only was it in his business, when I say he was involved in the city, he was involved in just about every meaningful civic organization. It was very altruistic, where he was doing it not for Colonel Rockwell, but for the city, which he loved very much. And uh, as history shows, the Allegheny Conference was really the author, with, with the then mayor, uh, Davy Lawrence, and General Mellon, 
as the kind of the godfathers, uh, Colonel Rockwell was right there beside them in, in the development of the first renaissance, which really converted this city from a smoky city with a very poor reputation to what is today a very beautiful city. And a lot of it we can attribute to people like Colonel Rockwell. Al was also active in many local, national, and international groups. He served on the board of Penn State University and Point Park College and received six honorary doctorates. He actually made Point Park College a four-year college, which not too many people realize. Al Rockwell was also responsible for Allegheny Airlines moving their headquarters to Pittsburgh. He was a big a stockholder and a very inf influential one. And I, I thought of that when they opened the new airport. I thought, gee, you know, going back to Al's days on the board of Allegheny Airlines, I wonder if they ever had any idea that, that their coming here would have such an impact on the, the greater Pittsburgh area. He was a dedicated outdoorsman and supported many wildlife and conservation efforts. In 1963, the Colonel went to Moscow with a group of American business leaders for a highly publicized meeting with Russian leaders, including Premier Khrushchev. Among the American participants was J. Leland Atwood, president of North American Aircraft. Lee Atwood had been with North American almost since it began making airplanes in 1934. Centered in California, the company had grown from an initial order for 238 observation planes into the largest allied aircraft builder in World War II. Now in the space age, they were the principal contractor for the Apollo Command and Service Modules and builders of the second stage of the giant Saturn booster rocket. But there was trouble at North American. Although they were the largest government contractor in the nation, their profit margin was extremely low. When blame for the 1967 Apollo capsule fire was laid at North American's door, sales and stock values tumbled. NASA even considered withdrawing part of their assignment. Al Rockwell picked up a Business Week article uh, that he was reading while he was on a plane flying somewhere and read about North American aviation and the problems that they were having being only in the aviation industry and the, the fact that they needed to diversify and had some of the difficulties that they were having at the time. And North American Aviation indeed was having some difficulties. He had a broad vision of diversity uh, for the company, uh, which had been spawned by the Colonel's problems after the war with, uh, with uh, being stuck only in the truck business uh, and the axle business, which was a very difficult period of time for them. And, and Al expanded on that concept of diversity uh, probably much more than the Colonel would have. Uh, but it was uh, very much a theme, very much a theme of con the conglomerates of the era. And uh, Al viewed the opportunity to uh, merge the North American aviation into Rockwell Standard as being able to build a broader based, more diversified uh, international company. Uh, and he literally got it out of the magazine article and, uh, and, and went to Lee Atwood, who was running the company at the time, and uh, proposed the transaction. And it very much was the case, uh, from a revenue point of view anyway, of uh, uh, you know, the fish that swallowed the whale, uh, because the Rockwell organization came out with uh, control and management leadership of, uh, of a much larger company in that, uh, in that business combination. The result was North American Rockwell. Initially, the colonel was named as chairman and Lee Atwood as president of the new company. A few months later, the colonel was promoted to honorary chairman and Al Rockwell took over as chairman. 
It was a difficult time for the colonel. He was 78 years old. His beloved wife, Clara, had recently passed away. To distract himself, he flew with the historic Rockwell Polar Flight for the first nonstop airplane flight to go over both poles. The colonel went as senior flight observer and stated flatly that he hoped he'd never come back. Now, on the business front, he felt that he was being pushed into the background. There was a lot of dissension, commotion, concern uh, that was very difficult for Al. The colonel uh, felt that he was being kept out of things, and in fact he was, because at that point, I guess the colonel would have been in his late 70s, uh, and uh, he just was not able to participate uh, or even comprehend some of the changes that were being dealt with as the company uh, moved at an increasing rate in that period. It was painful for Al. He had written his sisters about how difficult it was to try and work with their father and that he had tried, and I do believe that Al gave it a, a good effort to try and communicate with the colonel, but the colonel didn't give up the reins uh, easily and wanted to stay, wanted to participate. He was an aggressive guy all his life and it wasn't surprising that he took that approach. Al Rockwell placed the corporate headquarters of the new company in Pittsburgh and went to work. He hired Robert Anderson as his vice president and right-hand man. Anderson had been at Chrysler for 22 years and was known as a tough corporate infighter. In August of 1972, the company won its biggest victory by landing the $2.6 billion contract for the space shuttle. Overnight, North American Rockwell soared into a dominant position in the space program. In 1973, Al expanded the company again by merging Rockwell Manufacturing into North American Rockwell. The company was now Rockwell International. To reduce the company's dependence on government contracts, Al continued the strategy of diversification by buying into such businesses as electronics, printing presses, and textile machinery. Colonel Willard Rockwell had seen his little axle business grow into one of the largest companies in the world and his family grow and prosper. Within a year, he would be in a nursing home. On October 16, 1978, the human dynamo was still at last. He was 90 years old. It was Kipling who, in one of his poems, I think it's called If, said, if you can walk with princes without losing the common touch, you're a man. And that certainly describes the colonel. He never lost the common touch. And uh, as we all know, sometimes when people get into positions of power and prestige, they change a little bit. But the colonel was still the same workman he was when he came here. He never lost that touch. For Al Rockwell, the biggest battles were yet to come. As he approached the company's mandatory retirement age of 65, the idea of stepping down became less appealing to him. With the shuttle about to become a reality, he decided to fight for more time. At a board meeting in Richland, Washington in August of 1978, it was put to a vote. Al, as he approached the age of 65, uh, which was a, a retirement date and one which Al himself had said he would achieve and hold to, as he got closer and closer to it, he, I think he had uh, uh, concerns about giving up the helm, just as the colonel had concerns, even though the colonel was a much later time period. And, uh, uh, and he started uh, uh, finding a lot of fault with Bob Anderson, who was to replace him. And uh, Bob uh, uh, sensed that. Uh, prior to the Richland uh, meeting, uh, Bob went around and talked to all of the directors, because Al had been talking to them about the fact that maybe he should stay on and for another year or two and perhaps find another 
replacement for Bob Anderson. Uh, he lost that uh, uh, vote and was uh, very, very stricken by it. I mean, he was very emotionally defeated. To minimize disharmony, Al went through the motions of retirement. Rockwell International named him Chairman Emeritus. They even had a bronze bus cast of Al Rockwell. But Al was not ready to be put on the shelf. When the space shuttle Discovery is finally launched on its maiden voyage next month, a group of investors will be anxiously awaiting its return. They'll want to kick the orbiter's tires and check under its hood very carefully. The investors are talking about buying Discovery, and as Bruce Gellerman reports, perhaps the entire shuttle fleet. The group of investors is led by Willard Rockwell Jr., a man with a lot of experience with the shuttle orbiter. Rockwell is the former chairman of the board of the company that bears his family name, Rockwell International. It happens to be the primary contractor to NASA for the shuttle orbiter. Willard Rockwell and his investors have formed a new company based in Pittsburgh called Astrotech International. Rockwell is president of the corporation. Among other things, Astrotech prepares other companies' satellites for launch at the Kennedy Space Center. It's a job that until Astrotech came along was done only by NASA engineers. And it's just the first step in Willard Rockwell's ambitious plans for the commercialization of space by Astrotech. We have formed a subsidiary called Space Shuttle of America because we are negotiating with NASA to buy one or more shuttles and uh, we hope ultimately to buy the entire uh, space shuttle transportation system and operate it as a commercial operator. He, uh, in essence, concocted the idea of how he might be able to finance a shuttle and have it owned by the uh, public through a you know, public offering and, and that type of thing and uh, work it through where he could operate uh, a percentage of the fleet with the idea, I think, in the long term, of eventually seeing uh, the entire shuttle fleet uh, turned over to the private sector. Still, it was Dad's dream, so to speak, to, to see that shuttle come to the private forefront, even as airplanes had come. Uh, he would like to see business in space. Again, Willard Rockwell. We think that it is a, it is a viable commercial enterprise, and. Uh and we would uh, go out and find public investors who would be, who'd be willing to take that kind of a gamble. As an extra inducement for investors to take such a risk, Willard Rockwell says Astrotech may offer a chance in a stockholder lottery. First prize, a free ride aboard Astrotech's space orbiter. For National Public Radio, this is Bruce Gellerman in Washington. On January 28, 1986, the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger brought an end to the dream of the commercialization of space. The market after the Challenger loss was simply not going to hear any more about uh, raising funds for the privatization of space. The stock itself collapsed, and there wasn't any ability to raise capital. Uh, and at that t point in time, uh, Al became extremely stressed. He had invested millions of dollars of his own over a brief period of time to keep this company going, had leveraged the stock uh, when it was up by buying it on margin, and uh, had uh, sustained a multi-million dollar loss in the result. Uh, and he saw the prospects of not only himself losing a great deal of money, but the company uh, potentially collapsing. And that was a, a very, very difficult period for him. Well, what uh, we recognized as soon as the um, Challenger crisis occurred was that uh, in the launch vehicle business, there wouldn't be any more launches for about three years. And we found that the revenues that we had been depending upon had vanished overnight. And so we, we couldn't project the uh, occurrence of any business within the near term. And we didn't have the cash funds to be able to stay in place until those revenues began to come in. And it really, um, it just called for us to close operations.
I mean, and, and if you tried to, to summarize it, the colonel during his lifetime of the early industrial period had so much raw opportunity and he was an aggressive guy that could take it and put it together. During the development period of Al's lifetime, it was a much different strategy and a much different person uh, that uh, uh, the colonel could not have made it <laughs> uh, through the same time period. They would call for two different kinds of leaders. And, uh, and Al adapted uh, to be the kind of leader that he thought would best uh, continue on. Uh, the colonel had accrued a great deal of wealth and uh, probably the only egalitarian thing he ever did in his life was dissipate it through the family so as to minimize taxes. And uh, uh, Al uh, continued to accrue uh, wealth uh, on his own and then ran into a period of time where things changed and he, and he lost it all. And uh, again, that's the American experience, and uh, one that is played over again uh, constantly in some of the great American families, and uh, our family is, is no different in this expression. And at the same time, you know, near the end of his life, I could see that he really came to a peace in himself about all of this. And we were having lunch uh, one summer, our family had gathered together, and we were sitting at the table there, and, and uh, he said, you know, I had been up at Somerset, and I was just coming down the lake, and it was such a nice summer's day that I just pulled over to the side of the lake and took a nap. <laughs> so in that sense, even though it seems that he had lost everything, he came to the place where it appeared he had lost nothing. And I was glad to see him come to that. Fort Pitt, that's it. 